John, welcome to the Lowy Institute. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Sam. I'd like to start just by talking about your six years in uh, in Beijing. In in that time, you've witnessed the, the the widespread and rapid modernization of China in many respects, but not in all respects. In sure. fact, there are, there are experts who argue that uh, in the media sphere, for example, China is actually becoming more repressive and more censorious. Tell us what you saw from the inside, and would you say it's gotten it got harder or easier over the six years you were there to report mm. sensitive stories? Look, it's a, it's a really complicated situation because the answer is both um, harder and easier. Um, easier, and I think the easier overcomes the harder because the, the easier part about it is China is just a much more pluralistic place than it was six years ago. There's much more people with things to say. Mm. There's uh, many more ways to access that information. This whole online revolution that we're seeing, um, even a more diversified commercial media, even though it's mainly owned by the Communist Party in one form or another, mm. you know, it is more diverse than it used to be. Um, and that's balanced against the counter fact that you know, the party's censorship orders are becoming more regular, more draconian, um, and there's if anything, there's probably more abuses against journalists in China than there was when I started six years ago. Um, but I think the sum of all of that is it's still a, a an easier place to report than it was six years ago because so many more people have things to say than they used to. You talked just now about the online revolution in China. Mm. When Chinese visitors come here to the Lowy Institute, they'll often talk about that and sometimes it's in a slightly self-congratulatory way about uh, the way that uh, Weibo, for instance, the Chinese uh, Twitter equivalent, has, uh, has revolutionised Chinese politics and has opened up the space for public commentary. Do you agree? Mm. Uh, I do, with some caveats. I think it is a revolutionary technological kind of um, advance. Mm. Um, it means that people in China are part of a virtual network, a virtual civil society, which just wasn't there, at least to that extent, six years ago. Um, people realise or they see their own interests now aligned with you know, a whole network of people across the country. Um, mm. That is revolutionary. It is a way of, it is a, a medium of, of feedback for sure. And there are countless episodes where governments, the government has been forced to respond. Um, right. That said, it can also be overstated, and it is often overstated and used by Chinese policy makers, um, particularly diplomats and outward facing kind of talking heads to, um, to you know, as a, as a, the causation chain is often put, you know, the Chinese public demand China do such and such, and therefore you know, we're actually holding the line and being more conservative. Yes. Um, but I think that's usually way overstated, particularly in the foreign policy and, and the military space. And of course, it's, a, it's an open debate uh, in the West about whether uh, the internet has actually been a force for, for liberalisation and strong arguments for that uh, in the case of the Arab Spring. Sure. Others, uh, such as a, an American-based uh, critic, Yevgeny Morozov, who argues very strongly that uh, the internet can also be very much a tool of repression. Mm. Uh, do you see evidence of that in China as well? Look, it's overwhelmingly a democratic, uh, a force for, for democratisation in, in, in China without question. Mm. Like, it is the difference between, you know, what Twitter and the likes have meant in Australia, you know, um, they've changed the way debates are held, they sped up the, um, you know, the news cycle, mm. um, you know, all sorts of things, but, in the, but, it, but essentially the news is still kind of packaged and mediated through uh, through journalists, much as they always have, just through different mediums. Mm. In China, it was, um, you know, there was no such kind of foundation, and so the the, the Weibo revolution that you talked about, the online um, strata of information, is you know, is is coming in place of nothing that was there before. You know, it's actually created space for debate and information exchange that just didn't exist. Mm. Um, it has, through no doing of no active doing of the government, it has greatly liberalised the, the, the space for debate in China and uh, created a, a realm of transparency that didn't exist before. You're writing a book about the princelings. Indeed. Can you just briefly talk to us about who they are, mm. who are the princelings and why do they matter? Yeah, look, it's been fascinating to me over the years. There's been several people, uh, dozens actually, where I've, I've bumped into them and I thought, wow, you've got something really interesting to say and 
you know, you've somehow got a license to say it. How does that happen? Mm -hmm. Or you've done something which is amazing. And often it turns out to be because your father, or in some cases your mother, was somebody very important. You know, even Ai Weiwei, the artist, how did he, you know, how did he get away with saying what he did for so long? Because his father was, uh, you know, the leading poet of the communist revolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, countless examples like that of, you know, not of uh, not top tier princelings, but people who have background, so to speak. Um, and then that kind of crystallised in around about 2009, 2010 with Bo Xi Lai, you know, a very well-known princeling, as he began to kind of carve out his own fiefdom in Chongqing and mm. it really did reshape the national agenda. Um, and it became clear that nobody without that lineage, who wasn't the son of you know, one of the eight immortals, could have done what he did. Um, and that catalyzed a whole bunch of other princelings in the Chinese system, children of top leaders of the revolution, who were able to act and organize and speak their minds that others weren't. Mm. And so it's not that these guys are any smarter than anybody else. It's just that they have a special license, a special privilege to, to organize and speak that others don't. And that's what makes them such pivotal actors mm. in the Chinese scene today. And of course, Xi Jinping, the top leader, is himself a princeling. Yeah, and this raises actually the last question I wanted to ask you about, which is that the, the way these princelings behave mm. indicate that China is by no means a country of laws. The, the, the rule of law is a, is a very shaky concept mm. in China. Now you broke the Stern Hu story, of course, which I think was very evocative mm. for Australians in, this, in, in giving the impression that China uh, is not a place where, uh, as we do here, we rely on the rule of law to come mm. to sort of fair, independent uh, yeah. outcomes on yeah. disputes. Can you give us a sense of the direction of movement in China yeah. about the rule of law? Look, this is, I think, you know, if, if you're going to try and define one key question, this is probably it. Mm. Um, because if there's one thing that almost everybody agrees with in China, it is that China has to have a more credible legal system, a more credible way of arbitrating disputes, mm. even with the elite. You know, they, um, even people that don't at all like Bo Xi Lai or what mm. he did um, disagree with him being purged because there is no transparent process for this, you know, why him and not somebody else? Yeah. Um, and there's no question that the legal apparatus itself, the official apparatus has gone backwards um, in the time mm. that I've been there. Um, politics has been re-emphasised, you know, as explicitly um, overpowering law, so to speak. Um, politics is in command. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the expectations of rule of law have risen. So we've seen you know, the, an extraordinary class of lawyers who are even more professional and courageous than they were six years ago, mm -hmm. even though the system hasn't adapted with them. Um, and there's very few senior Chinese officials who wouldn't agree that China needs to evolve to a more rule-based um, system. But that essentially is, is, the, is the great battle underway, because how do people who are in power agree to give it up, to be yes. subject to anybody else's um, scrutiny. Mm. John, thanks for your time. Great pleasure, thank you. Mm.